Thank you, Senator Ryan. Senator Ludlam. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Mr. Acting Deputy, Deputy President. Um, I rise today to add some comments. Senator Waters uh, has carried this debate for the Australian Greens. Um, as this is an area of uh, great interest and expertise of hers. So I'm going to confine my uh, responses this morning to those that directly impact on Western Australia. I think this is one good example of how crossbench collaboration can actually bring an unwilling government to the table for a result that um, improves and acts in the public interest and for environmental protection. Um, I would also like to acknowledge uh, Mr Windsor for bringing it forward in the other place and for negotiating uh, with the Greens on the proposal that these powers would remain with the Commonwealth Government and the right place for them is Commonwealth environmental legislation, specifically the EPBC Act, rather than deferring and delegating these powers away to state governments that have shown themselves hopelessly captive, uh, captive of the very fossil fuel industries that they would seek to regulate. So within those broad parameters, I want to speak briefly about a serious loophole, and I don't for a moment believe that this um, has been introduced into the bill intentionally. I think it is a genuine mistake and results much more from geology than politics, but now it is upon us to remedy that problem. Because shale and tight gas are different forms of unconventional gas to coal seam gas, they are of course just as damaging to the water and the environment as the types that this bill is dealing with today, and they also require the same highly damaging and risky extractive techniques of hydraulic fracking, including the use of injected chemicals to get these materials out of the ground. Now, Western Australia has the fifth largest reserve of shale gas in the world. The drafting and the way that this uh, amendment that we're debating is drafted excludes shale gas from consideration and deals with coal seam gas only. Now, simply because unconventional gas resources on shore come from different forms of geological uh, strata in different, different formations shouldn't mean that a third of the Australian continent should be free from this kind of protection measure. If the Australian government believes that this amendment is worth passing, that Commonwealth environmental law will be improved with the inclusion of a water trigger for coal seam gas, then there is no reason at all why you wouldn't extend its ambit to include shale gas and other forms of unconventional onshore gas which Western Australia has a large and extremely unfortunate endowment. The WA Department of Mines and Petroleum, as you would imagine, with WA holding the fifth largest reserve of shale gas in the world, these things are always somewhat uncertain, given that the resources are underground and not necessarily very easy to prove up. But the WA Department of Mines expresses huge enthusiasm for unconventional gas mining. In fact, the West Australian government's so-called strategic energy initiative which was neither strategic nor showed any particular initiative, rests for Western Australia's domestic uh, electricity supply as we're busy shipping our uh, northwest shelf LNG trade to the lowest bidder and exporting that as rapidly as we can get it out of the ground. The WA Strategic en Energy Initiative uh, proposes that West Australia should become almost entirely dependent for our electricity generation on a mix of coal and unconventional gas. So this is, an interest of, uh, this is an area of enormous interest to Western Australians, that the WA government has no plans in place for renewable energy taking up any, any sort of substantial fraction of the electricity mix in WA, but instead proposes that unconventional onshore gas should take up the slack, which presupposes a, a drilling campaign across particular geological regions of WA unprecedented in West Australian history. The government hasn't done any sort of due diligence, this is the West Australian government that I refer to, that would be required if we were to ensure that unconventional gas mining, whether it be shale and tight gas fracking, would not cause unacceptable damage to the WA environment and to public health. There have been no environmental assessments, there have been no attempts to consider land scale, scale, a landscape scale impacts, or which would have been the appropriate level of assessment for an industry of this type. What we're actually seeing in WA, which is a couple of years behind, the extraordinary confrontations that we've seen in New South Wales and Queensland that have brought this legislation to the foreground, we are seeing WA proposing to repeat exactly those mistakes. And if we get there through the kind of headlong rush to support the gas industry and its ambitions, we will find that this amendment, which proposes a water trigger to the EPBC, will not protect West Australian landholders, Aboriginal stakeholders 
or advocates for the environment will not protect those issues because of a loophole in the bill, which effectively simply uh, draws the geological definition of unconventional gas too tightly in constraining it to coal seam gas. In WA, there's been very little attempt to engage local communities in a discussion about whether they want a tight gas and shale gas industry in the state of Western Australia. In the Midwest, there was community consultation that consisted of little more than government-sponsored industry circuses for the gas industry, and the Kimberley has seen, if anything, less consultation. There are an estimated 297 or 300 trillion cubic feet TCF of shale and tight gas in WA. It's, it's an extraordinary resource and it dwarfs some of the reserves on the east coast. If a new shale gas industry goes ahead on the scale imagined in WA, the cost of mitigating the carbon pollution will be borne elsewhere in the economy. And CSIRO recently re released a report that confirmed what many of us have been saying for years, that the long-term impacts of chemicals used in and released by fracking are unknown and are risky. This is in the driest continent on the planet, and the western third of that continent would be unprotected by the measure that we're debating here today. So the Greens oppose the Barnett government's reckless promotion of the fledgling shale and tight gas industry. We call on the Commonwealth government, and I hope we will get government support for this amendment when we put it in the committee stage, to recognise shale gas in this bill. I won't address that in too much detail now, but we do have an amendment to that effect. If we believe that landholders on the east coast should be protected from the violations of groundwater and environmental integrity uh, and agricultural productivity posed by this industry, then I would like to know why Western Australians shouldn't be similarly protected. The department, as I said, estimates that about 10 per cent of Western Australia is prospective for shale gas. We have three major basins that either are known or are highly prospective to contain unconventional gas. The Canning Super Basin, which underlies a large part of the Kimberley, is estimated to hold at least 200 TCF of that gas. And if you want to compare that, with some of the known reservoirs on the east coast, you will get an understanding of the magnitude of the resource, if you want to call it that, in WA. The Perth Basin, which lies along the coastline from Busselton up to Carnarvon and beyond, is the most advanced in terms of proving the resource up and moving it towards production. The onshore Carnarvon Basin, which lies between Shark Bay and Exmouth and inland. The Officer Basin, uh, in which exploration is only uh, fairly recent. WA is highly prospective. And right now we're expecting the next three um, fracking wells to take place in the north, north of the Perth Basin near Eniaba. Um, in the Canning Basin, that, that colossal reserve, Baru is confident that its discoveries in the Valhalla Pal Paradise uh, region will be backed up with more gas shows out of the Laurel Foundation uh, formation. So there's a lot of activity at the moment. We haven't seen the sort of pitched battles and lock the gate campaigns that we've seen on the east coast. Some of these sites are very remote. Uh, and they are more of concern to Aboriginal landholders than, for example, to pastoralists or to settled agriculture and irrigated agriculture, as we see in the East Coast. But it doesn't make this technology any less damaging. The onshore Carnarvon Basin is still in the very early stages of exploration, but given the success of the offshore gas field, we wouldn't be surprised to see petroleum onshore as well. So we have this extraordinary land rush and scramble into Western Australia. We are extremely concerned about water use, because fracking is a process that uses a lot of water that in WA will have to be sourced locally. Now, the US EPA estimates that about 19 million litres is required to drill and frack a well. Where is that proposed to come from in WA? And the WA Minister for Mining estimating that roughly 300 wells are needed to drain a small gas field. That's 5.7 gigalitres of water. Uh, given the location of the known fields in and around Iniaba and throughout the Midwest, and the competition for that water that already exists with Midwest mining companies, we need to seriously consider the licensing and extraction of this much water for the purposes of gas fracking. Now, a huge part of the controversy over this industry has centred on the chemicals that are used to try and open up the fractures in the geology to release the gas. The chemicals are used for engineering reasons and, for the most part, they are treated as commercial in confidence. The idea that in this country, as they've done in the United States, we would let the fossil fuel industry inject poisonous chemicals into groundwater reserves that they won't even tell the public what they are because it might breach some commercial in confidence considerations 
just shows you how far uh, gone this industry really is. To frack a single well can take as much as 19 million litres of, of fluid. So a megalitre is a cubic metre of fluid. 19 cubic metres of fluid to frack a single well. And that works out to up to uh, between 85 and 380,000 litres of unknown chemicals, poisonous chemicals, per well. So the public don't know what the chemicals are, and the department won't tell us. So I suspect that's the sort of thing, as has happened in the United States, that eventually comes out by way of leak and whistleblowing, putting the industry on the defensive. Why not simply disclose it at the outset, particularly if we're being told that these chemicals are entirely harmless? In response to public pressure, industry is starting to put out a little bit of information regarding these chemicals online. And they say, household chemicals, walnut husks, you know, wells that emit nothing but butterflies, there's no danger at all. Now, I say thousands of litres of household chemicals are nothing at all, uh, that these are something that we should be extremely concerned about. There's a reason that these things have little skulls and crossbones on the labels and we don't let kids go anywhere near them. So the information that the uh, government or that the industry has released so far is entirely inadequate. Now, apart from contamination through these unknown chemical additives in, the, in volumes of, of thousands and hundreds of thousands of tonnes, there is also a huge concern about methane in groundwater. Methane is the cause of the flaming tap water that people would have seen in some of the advocacy videos and materials coming from the United States. Water that ignites. What a wonderful idea. And methane is not considered a contaminant in and of itself. It is, however, entirely flammable and is a potent greenhouse gas. The US EPA has just come down with some new rules around well completions that mean that new completions must not vent or flare, but must trap and sequester the gas produced in testing. We don't have anything like those rules in Western Australia, because we are operating under a state government administration that couldn't care less about the greenhouse gas emissions. It has sucked up, without any kind of critique, the statements of the gas industry that say, because we are better than, un than, than uh, coal, than old forms of coal-fired power, we are therefore good for the environment. And of course, nothing could be further than the truth. Shale gas exploration in WA's northern, uh, or all along the Perth Basin really, will also have serious impact on agricultural land. If the Commonwealth and if the state government wants to prevent the kind of collisions and contests that are occurring on the Liverpool Plains and across Queensland, one thing that they could do would be to take very good care about the collision between this industry and farmers and pastoralists in WA. With each pad requiring roughly three hectares of land, plus all the roading and pipeline infrastructure, we can see the sort of damage that is likely to be done. And when announcing the halving of royalty rates for the unconventional gas industry, the minister noted that approximately 10 times the number of wells would need it to be drilled to extract the same amount of gas. So what has looked like in other jurisdictions, a well every couple of hundred metres and a spaghetti of road and pipeline connections holding it all together, could be coming soon to Western Australia. And under the protections that we legislate today, because of the good work of the crossbenchers in the other place and here in the Senate, WA will be left out of those protections such as do exist. Now, there are risks associated with, with hydraulic fracking in France and Bulgaria, various townships in the United States and other jurisdictions have voted to ban this technique. The state of Vermont in the United States signed their fracking ban into law. Now, these countries and other jurisdictions are seeing that the safest place for them to manage the environmental and health issues associated with fracking is not to do it at all. It's already occurring in WA without any environmental impact assessment, with no regulatory oversight by the government's environmental agencies, either the EPA or the Department of Environment and Conservation. This activity is regulated entirely under the Petroleum Act, administered by the Department of Mines and Petroleum, which is the number one promoter of the industry. So it's not even that we have a captive regulator, we have no regulator at all. The Auditor General has found that the DMP has been critically deficient in their compliance monitoring and their enforcement activities for environmental conditions across the whole suite of extractive activities that they regulate. And that is why it is so important that the Greens were able to negotiate that these powers, such as they are, remain with the Commonwealth. Because the WA authorities are entirely captive to and see themselves as a promotional arms of the fossil fuel industries that they enable. WA does not need a gas fracking industry at this time to secure energy for the future, as claimed by proponents of the industry. And in fact, it is entirely likely, and the state governments 
our strategic energy initiative shows in black and white exactly how this will operate. The insistence on squeezing the last fossil drop out of West Australian geology when we should be by now well and truly into the age of renewables shows how pursuing an unconventional gas industry in WA and across the country can actually constrain development of renewable energy alternatives because the regulatory expertise and the, the interest within government, the promotional work, the workshops, the conferences are all being brought to bear on maintaining and extending the fossil fuel incumbents at the expense of the renew renewable industries that we should be turning to. The state government, for example, is providing very significant subsidies to the fracking industry, including more than $100 million in unconventional gas exploration subsidies via royalties for regions. What an extraordinary waste of taxpayers' money in order to help the extractive fossil fuel industry squeeze the last drop of carbon out of the Western Australian landscape. There's a 50 per cent royalty reduction for the industry. Now, we have entirely untapped energy sources in WA. And we have, um, with the help of a group of engineers and advocates known as Sustainable Energy Now in Western Australia, developed the WA Energy 2029 proposal for what it would look like to get 100 per cent renewable energy. And as dismissive as Senator Sinodinus was when he says nobody's ever looked uh, at the possibility of doing 100 per cent renewable energy in Australia, apart from he rather dismissively acknowledges Green Left Weekly. The Australian government's own energy market regulator has just undertaken a study that says, yes, it is possible. It's going to cost money. It's going to require political will and an investment. And in fact, what is going to cost us much more is to blindly plough on with business as usual. I commend to the government the Energy 2029 proposal, and I also commend to you, and I'll take up when we get to the committee stage on this bill, I will want to know if the government is supporting the Australian Greens amendment that we will move to bring the entire continent into these measures, if the Liverpool Plains is worth protecting and if Queensland is worth protecting, then so is the Perth Basin and so is the Fitzroy Valley. Now, that's the job that we've been brought here to do today, is to ensure that such regulations as do exist to at least provide a minimum due diligence before we allow the gas industry to frack Australian uh, uh, water resources across the length and breadth of the continent, then it should apply to all states and territories. I would invite my uh, coalition colleagues uh, from Western Australia, a number of them who are in the chamber now, to explain whether they would support an amendment to bring Western Australia within the ambit of this legislation. No, Senator Cormann, I'll happily take that acknowledgement. Then you stand condemned, Senator Cormann, for leaving Western Australia unprotected, uh, even as there is an acknowledgement, at least on this side of the chamber and on the crossbenches, that some protection is warranted that some environmental oversight by the Commonwealth for protection of water resources is required. So I will then have to trust that Labor senators will join with the crossbenchers in passing an amendment that at least offers this minimal degree of protection for Western Australians as it does for the rest of the country. Thank you, Senator Ludlam.